When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. He's making a truth claim. He's either wrong or he's right. And the reason I'm convinced he's right is because he lived a sinless life, he taught amazing teachings, he bled and died on a cross forgiving and loving his enemies, and he rose from the dead. The dude's in touch with reality, just in case you haven't noticed. And that is why trusting in him is so wise because he has a grip on reality that's phenomenal. He's totally credible and reliable in his teachings, ethical teachings, lifestyle, death, and resurrection. You can trust him and you can grow in that trust more and more each day. Pretty impressive worship, wasn't it? My goodness. Five questions this morning. First one. If God's so powerful and so loving, why is there so much suffering? Why is there so much evil and destruction? What's God's problem? Is he asleep on the switch or something? Second question, doesn't science contradict faith? Doesn't faith mean you commit intellectual suicide and you blindly believe? Third question, you believe that Jesus really rose from the dead? When was the last time you saw some dead person get up and walk around. Fourth question, you believe Jesus is really the only way to God? Isn't that narrow-minded, bigoted, intolerant? Fifth question, the Bible's 2,000 years old. What gives you any degree of certainty that we really have what those eyewitnesses wrote 2,000 years ago? Those are the five questions we're going to go over. First one. If God is so loving and so powerful, then why do you suffer so much? Why do innocent people get raked over the coals? What's going on? Doesn't God care? Or is he simply too weak to do anything about it? Now, one of the reasons that I think if you don't have a home church, you should make Fellowship Church your home church is because of what Pastor Ed and his precious wife Lisa went through in losing their precious daughter in 2021. I mean, you're a pastor. That's not supposed to happen to you and your wife. Well, sorry, all of us suffer. It's part of reality. And when Pastor Ed and Lisa wrote that book about the pathway through pain, I got to look at it a bit last night the vulnerability, the honesty is incredible. So why? Why does God allow people to get destroyed by circumstances, by other people? Is God disinterested? First part of the answer is, I do not know. I don't know why God allowed evil and suffering. For thousands of years, philosophers and theologians, far more intelligent than me, have struggled with that issue, and they've never come up with an ultimate answer. And the Bible does not answer that question ultimately. So I do not know. And I can promise you, in 1997, when I went out to Madison, Wisconsin, where my brother, younger brother, was a transplant surgeon, transplanting kidneys and livers, I went out there because his seven-year-old daughter had just been crushed in a car accident to death. And if you think that I'm going to go out, meet my brother who's far more intelligent than I'll ever be, and explain to him why God allowed his seven-year-old daughter to be crushed by a pickup truck coming down the road at 55 miles an hour, why the babysitter didn't see the stop sign, ran the stop sign, and that pickup truck slammed to the side of the car, sending my seven-year-old niece to an early grave, I'm not going to do that because I'd be lying. I do not know why God allowed evil and suffering. Yeah, but come on, Cliff, you've got to think. Well, yeah, we do have to think. You're right. And one of my thoughts on is the issue is this, which I think is very biblical. God chose to limit his power by creating us with a free will, which means I can either pull out my wallet and give you money to eat lunch, or I can roll this hand into a fist, send it crashing into your handsome face, I am free to do either. And what the Bible teaches is in Genesis chapter 1, God created us. 
in his image, which means we are not robots, we're not machines, and I like to walk, so if I stumble and fall off of this stage, I'm not gonna pick myself up at the bottom and say, phew, I'm glad that's over with. That's determinism, that's fatalism. God creates us in his image, which means we're not robots, we're not machines, we're human beings created with a soul, a personality, but it also means we got a free will. And if we want to abuse our free will, we can go right ahead and do it. But there will be a day of judgment when God promises to hold us responsible for the free decisions that we have made. And that's why Joshua stands before the people of Israel and says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Genesis 1 says, God created this and God saw that it was good. And God created that and God saw that it was good. And you gotta get the point, guys. When an author repeats and repeats and repeats a little phrase, obviously he's trying to get the point across. When God created, he did a good job. And that little phrase, God saw that it was good, is repeated and repeated and repeated in Genesis 1. But in Genesis chapter 3, we read how human beings rebelled against God. They didn't eat an apple. They ate some fruit. But that is symbolic of their rebellion against God. It's symbolic of sin. And why do I sin? I sin because I think I'm smarter than God, and I know it'll make me happier. So I'm going to do it my way instead of God's ways. Not because I'm trying to be evil. I'm not trying to be evil. I'm trying to be happy. My problem is I think I know how to make Cliff happier than God knows. And that's basically what Adam and Eve did. We know what will make us happier. We will define good and evil. We will assume godhood. And when they made that decision, that's where the train got off the track. That's where the arrow missed the mark and things got ugly fast. Because when God steps back, chaos fills the gap. Now what's one of the main points of the book of Job? One of the main points of the book of Job in the Old Testament is, life is unfair, God is fair. Don't get the two mixed up. Life is unfair, God is fair. Do not get the two mixed up. So when you suffer, if you clench your fist and wave it at God, that's misplaced anger. Misplaced anger. It's not God who's getting you. Rather, it's you're born into a cursed, unfair, messed up world. Life hurts. And to blame God is a cop out. The same way if I hold back, slap you in the face, and then turn to you and say, God made me do it. That is a cop out. I'm lying through my teeth to you. He gave me a free will. I am responsible for feeding you or I am responsible for slapping you. God gave me that innate ability. That's part of why I believe we have a soul. Because you see, friends, if there is no God, you don't have a free will. If there is no God, you just are a chemical reaction between your two ears. That's all you are. And determinism wins the day. Fatalism wins the day. What will be will be. What is is. No, the Bible teaches we've been created in the image of God, we have a soul. And that means a rational mind, a free will, the ability to love or to hate or to be indifferent. We choose. All right, so we choose to rebel against God, and that's where suffering, evil, and death enter the experience of humankind. Then we go to the Gospels. And in the Gospels, what does Jesus do? He comforts. Now, what is comforting based on? It's based on presence, presence. People comfort me by being present. People don't comfort me by preaching a sermon to me. People comfort me when they make their presence real, when they're with me. They don't have great points to make. They don't talk a lot. It is their presence that I need, all right. The biggest comfort you and I will ever get in this life is the presence of God, the presence of Jesus Christ. Well, how on earth do you experience that? You open up your heart, you open up your life by praying, by repenting, by growing and trusting Christ, by obeying him, by meeting with other believers, by having a church family, allowing God to speak to you through other people in small groups, in one-on-one -on -one conversations, in a worship service. 
and you begin to build an understanding of the presence of God. Job asked a lot of questions of God, a lot of hard questions. Finally, God comes to Job, Job chapter 38. And we got four chapters of God speaking to Job. Did God answer one of Job's questions? Nope. He did not answer one of Job's questions. What did he do for Job? He gave Job an overwhelming sense of his presence. And that presence of God brought tremendous comfort to Job. Ah, oh, you stupid person. You're going to go to church every Sunday? Don't you know all the athletic events that your children could be attending Sunday morning? You're really dumb. You're hurting your child. No, you're not. You are teaching your child how to position themselves to experience the presence of God. Oh, you read the Bible every day? You read the Bible every day, you pray every day, you have a quiet time? What an incredible waste of your time. Don't you know that if you were on the job, you could be making more money? Mm-hmm, possibly true. Well, let me tell you why I'm gonna do it. Because I wanna know God better. I wanna experience his presence better because life's gonna get rocky, real rocky, in your future and in my future. And the presence of God is one of the key ways that we experience comfort in this life. So yes, there's a lot of suffering. And yet Jesus Christ wants to comfort us. And he also bled and died on a cross. So if ever anybody says to you, the reason you suffer is that you don't have enough faith. Isn't it sad that Jesus didn't have enough faith? Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Did the Father take the cup away from Jesus? Nope. Did the Father answer Jesus' prayer the way I would have liked him or Jesus would have liked him to do it? Nope. Jesus went straight to the cross. One of the most painful, excruciating deaths possible, death by crucifixion. But what Jesus did was, he surrendered to the Father. He said, if it is possible, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Then, three days after he died, he rose from the dead. Which means we have the ultimate solution for suffering. And that ultimate solution for suffering is not a drug high. It's not slitting your wrists. It's not hopping into bed with someone and having promiscuous sex. It's not the solution. The solution is eternal life, which begins now as we experience the presence of God and then it continues through eternity. When Christ returns, he will give us new bodies. He's gonna give my little niece, who was knocked into an early grave at the age of seven, Annie, a new body. And my brother Stuart is gonna be, and his wife, Mary Banks, are gonna be reunited with their precious little daughter. And I will get to see Annie one day. And Ed and Lisa, are going to see their precious little daughter as well, Lee Beth, one day. Because Lee Beth put her faith in Christ and Ed and Lisa put their faith in Christ and Christ promises eternal life to all who trust in him. Amen. That's the ultimate solution. <laughs> so now my atheist agnostic friend, let's go to the hospital. Come on, my atheist agnostic friend. Let's go into the room where the kid lies whose body's being shredded by some perverse disease. Come on, my atheist agnostic friend. What is your solution? You're gonna kick back and say, well, if God was all powerful and all loving, this wouldn't happen. That is such a theoretical, bogus question to focus on. The kid's dying. Let's get a little more practical. Is there a solution? No, if there is no God, there is no solution. Because if there is no God, when we die, we go to the fertilizer pit. And Adolf Hitler's in the fertilizer pit, and so is Mother Teresa in the fertilizer pit. And that's where I'm headed and you're headed, if there is no God. So don't talk to me about a solution. I, as a follower of Christ, will walk to the other side of the bed, and I too will hold that child's hand and seek to comfort that child. But in Jesus Christ, we have God's ultimate solution to the very real problem of suffering, evil, and death. Forgiveness and eternal life in heaven, where there will be no more evil 
injustice, unfairness, death. Revelation 21.4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order has been wiped away. Behold, all things have become new. So the bottom line question is, do you have God's solution to the very real problem of suffering and pain? Do you have Jesus Christ? Second question, don't science and faith contradict each other? No, they don't. Why? Because science is not a relationship. Science is a study of process, how nature works. It's a brilliant field of knowledge. Why can we do science? Because God has given us rational minds and we, by using our rational minds in a reasonable fashion, can ascertain truth. We can grasp truth. Johann Kepler, the father of modern astronomy, as he peered out into the stars at night, exclaimed, oh God, I am thinking your thoughts after you. That is good science and it's good faith. Russell Cowburn is a professor of experimental physics at Cambridge University. Russell Cowburn, as a professor of experimental physics at Cambridge University says, you can't work in science and not be struck by the amazingness of the universe. And I love this line. A good day in the lab is a cause for worship. That's good. Because you come out of it seeing God's creation just a little bit more clearly than when the day started. A good day in the lab is a cause for worship. Because when you begin to grapple with the amazingly intricate design of the universe, the exquisite beauty, it points you directly to God, and then you begin to worship God, you begin to stand in awe of God for his explosive creativity, for his goodness, for his, the gift of beauty that he's given us to enjoy. So science is good. Now what is faith? Faith is not, I believe, I believe, I believe. I'm gonna try harder. I believe, I believe, I believe. No, that's intellectual naivete. If Jesus Christ had hated people, if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, I would not believe in Christ. The reason that I believe in Christ is because the evidence, historical in nature, is he taught amazing ethical teachings, he lived a sinless, morally perfect life, the way I have tried to and have miserably failed. He died a death forgiving his enemies who nailed him to the cross. I'd have been cursing those suckers from the cross, not forgiving them. And then three days after he died, he physically bodily rose from the dead and over a period of 40 days, he appeared to over 500 people who saw him risen from the dead. So the overwhelming evidence is he is reliable. So for a Christian, faith is the following. Evidence of reliability plus commitment. The evidence is historical in nature. He lived a sinless life. Obviously, the guy who taught the Sermon on the Mount was an ethical genius. Well, that was Jesus. Thirdly, he dies forgiving his enemies. And fourthly, he rises from the dead. So the evidence is you can trust him. Now you need to make a commitment to him. I need to make a commitment to him. I need to respond to that evidence by trusting in him, by committing. Well, faith is stupid. No, 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 no. Faith is the biggest compliment you can give another person and it's the biggest compliment you can give Christ. Let's say I have the privilege of meeting you after the service. And after meeting you, I walk away from you like this. What's that a statement of? It's a statement that I think you're a crook. I think you got a knife or a gun and you're gonna go get me. No, trusting someone is a statement. Here's how I view your character. You are good, you are fair, you are just, and therefore I will trust you. Well, faith in Jesus Christ is not stupidity. Faith in Jesus Christ is a statement 
that I understand your character, Christ, is good. Therefore, I'm going to trust you. And that is what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who understands God is good. Jesus Christ is reliable. Therefore, I'm going to trust him. That is not irrational. That is very reasonable. It's not based on proof. No proof. It's based on evidence of reliability. Third question. Did he really rise from the dead? No. He did not rise from the dead. If, if there is no supernatural God, if all of reality is matter and energy, then obviously there's no life after death. It's impossible. If all of reality is matter and energy, there's no life after death, friends. If there's no supernatural God, then your life is you move dirt, and when you die, the dirt moves you. It's that simple. But if there is a supernatural God who created you in the first place, then it's totally reasonable to believe if he chose, he could give you life after death, eternal life. Now the historical evidence is that Jesus really died on the cross. In the Gospel of John we read how they took the body of Christ off the cross and they put it in a tomb of a very well-known man, Joseph of Arimathea. This was no hidden tomb. His disciples dispersed in disillusionment, and three days after he died, he rose from the dead and first of all appeared to some grief-torn women. And you have to understand, in the first century, women were not allowed to get an education and they were not allowed to testify in court. That's how bad the sexism was. Pathetic chauvinism, sexism. Women were viewed as inferior. In spite of the fact the Bible teaches God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, he created them. Folks miss that part. And so the sexism was tragic. And yet Jesus attacks that sexism and appears, first of all, to some grief-torn women. Then over a period of 40 days, he appears to over 500 people, Paul writes in approximately 52 AD in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he appears risen from the dead. Many of those people are willing to die for what they claim to have seen, the dead Christ risen from the dead. They weren't like the kamikaze pilots in World War II, dying for a belief. They died for what they claimed to have seen, the dead Christ risen from the dead. The historical evidence is Jesus was stone dead, buried in a tomb, three days later, rose from the dead. Yeah, he rose from the dead. But I still have a problem. I still struggle with doubt. I mean, just imagine, there I am in the cemetery performing another funeral, and we got this box called a casket there, and it's about to be lowered down into the ground. And I'm supposed to tell people, oh, because this person put their faith in Christ, they got life after death. They're going to have a new resurrection body. And I'm sitting there saying, really? Wow. So what I do is I look up. I look at the sky. I really like to go out at night and pray as I'm looking up at the stars and the moon. This is a really big place we live in, this universe, this cosmos. Now, if there's an intelligent mind who's so powerful, so creative, so intelligent that he created the universe, do you think he can raise a dead body to life and give you eternal life? Yeah, that's easy compared to creating the universe. Here's the analogy that helps me. If you bake a loaf of bread from scratch, can you toast a Pop-Tart? Yeah. Yeah, if you can bake a loaf of bread from scratch, if you can make a loaf of bread, I think you'll be able to figure out how to toast a Pop-Tart. Okay, so I'm standing there next to the casket or the urn, and all of a sudden I begin to realize in my doubts, wait a second, he created the universe. That's like making a loaf of bread from scratch. Do you think he can raise a dead body to life? Pretty small, this 
one body compared to the universe. Yeah, it's like toasting a Pop-Tart. So the evidence is Jesus rose from the dead. And based on that evidence, I have hope for eternal life. And that is the basis for hope from eternal life, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Fourthly, how can you believe that Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life? Well, it's real simple. I don't say that. Jesus said that. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, no woman comes to the Father except through me. Oh, Cliff, that's narrow-minded arrogance. Well, it might be. Yeah, I do struggle with arrogance. But no, it's a truth claim. And if I tell you that two plus two equals four and not five or three, that's not necessarily arrogance on my part. It's a truth claim. Two plus two does not equal five. Two plus two does not equal three. It equals four. Now, in spite of the fact that I can be an arrogant twit at times, I don't have to be when I simply say two plus two equals four, not five, not three. If I say to you, every path leads to heaven, is that a truth claim? Of course it is. I'm saying every path leads to heaven. That's a truth claim. If I tell you half the paths, half the religions lead to heaven, is that a truth claim? Of course it is. I'm saying half are wrong, half are right. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. He's making a truth claim. He's either wrong or he's right. And the reason I'm convinced he's right is because he lived a sinless life, he taught amazing teachings, he bled and died on a cross forgiving and loving his enemies, and he rose from the dead. The dude's in touch with reality, just in case you haven't noticed. And that is why trusting in him is so wise. Because he has a grip on reality that's phenomenal. He's totally credible and reliable in his teachings, ethical teachings, lifestyle, death, and resurrection. You can trust him, and you can grow in that trust more and more each day. And then the fifth question is, well, what about the Bible? Is the Bible reliable or is it not? Well, I can promise you, I could never prove to you that the Bible's a word of God. So I'm not gonna waste my time trying or your time listening. Instead, the evidence is that the New Testament Gospels are historically reliable. Why? Because I have tests and I would encourage you to have tests and I'd encourage you to teach your children to have tests to determine historical reliability. My four tests are internal consistency. Are there contradictions within the text that point to massive confusion? Secondly, what's the literary style? Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. That's mythology, sweet fairy tale. No, that is not the literary style of the Gospels. The literary style of the Gospels are, at this time in this place, with these people around, Jesus said this and he did that. It reads like the New York Times, the LA Times. Third test, archaeology. Are we talking about the island of Atlantis out in the ocean that none of us can verify? No. We're talking about Bethlehem, Nazareth, Jerusalem, Rome. Did Jesus float a boat on the Sea of Atlantis? No. Sea of Galilee. Archaeologically verifiable places. And then fourth test, come on, man. Those New Testament Gospels are almost 2,000 years old. What gives you any degree of certainty that you really have what those dudes wrote? Well, it's real simple. The New Testament that we have in English today is based on over 5,800 Greek manuscripts or pieces of manuscript found from the 2nd through the 11th century around the known world of that day, which was the Mediterranean, Rome down around to Alexandria, Egypt, all agreeing to an infinitesimal degree. And if we didn't have all those manuscripts, we have 38,289 quotes from the early church fathers who were quoting the New Testament between the second and fourth century AD. There are only 11 verses in the New Testament that are not quoted by the early church fathers between the second and fourth century AD. So we could put the whole New Testament together just based on their quotes. We have a very reliable New Testament. You can read it and ask yourself, does the evidence of his life, teachings, death, and resurrection point to his credibility or not? Now, why do I trust the Bible as the word of God? Because I've seen the historical evidence point to Christ being the truth. I have made a commitment to Christ and put my faith in him, and I have experienced his trustworthiness. How did Jesus treat the Old Testament? As the word of God. 
Matthew 5, 18, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, by, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He taught the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, the Torah, as the word of God. How did he view his own teachings? Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will disappear, my words will never disappear. Whoa. He treated his words as the word of God. That's why I do. Well, what about that rascal Paul and Peter and James? Well, the eyewitness community accepted those writings as the word of God. That's why I do. Now, I can't show you that the Bible's a word of God because I can't give you my experience of the trustworthiness of Jesus Christ. You got to do that for yourself. You got to look at the historical evidence. You got to put your faith in Christ if the evidence is he's reliable. Then you've got to develop a relationship with him. And as you develop that relationship, you will experience his trustworthiness in your own life. And then you'll begin to realize, oh yeah, the Bible is more than just a great work of literature. It indeed is inspired by God. It's the word of God. All right, I'm gonna lead in a short prayer. It's not a magical formula, but maybe some of this is beginning to make sense to you like never before. It's a short prayer to put your faith in Jesus Christ to ask him for forgiveness, to trust that he died on the cross for your sin, and then to commit your life to him. And if you're at the point in your life where such a decision would be appropriate because it's beginning to make sense and the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and you want to respond to Christ by trusting in him, I would like to invite you to pray silently after me. This is between you and Christ and nobody else. Let's bow and pray together. Lord Jesus, I know there's a gap between the person I should be and the person I am. Please forgive me for my wrongdoing. Thank you that you promised to. Lord Jesus, I trust that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my wrongdoing. Thank you for the gift of eternal life you give me. Lord Jesus, I got some bad habits. I've got some addictions. I got some hurts, some pretty deep pain. Please put your Holy Spirit in me. Help me to become the beautiful person you created me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching the Ed Young YouTube channel. That's right, and if you want to be inspired, encouraged, and challenged like never before, subscribe and click the notification button. We believe this channel can help change your life.